Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. When I woke up in the morning, nothing seemed out of the ordinary except that my wife Debbie wasn't in bed next to me. I am usually up a little earlier because I start work at 8 o'clock and my wife not until 9.30. I completed my morning routine and was heading downstairs to get the coffee ready for my wife and me when I smelled the coffee already being made. When I got downstairs, there was my wife already dressed for work sitting at the corner breakfast table. She smiled at me and we said our good mornings. As I was grabbing a cup of coffee, my wife said, I have to go into work early this morning for a meeting. I will be off at 5 o'clock and come straight home so we can talk as soon as you get home. It caught me a little off guard, and I raised an eyebrow and asked, Oh, oh did I forget something? What do we need to talk about? Debbie just waved a hand at me and said that we would talk about it later, that it was nothing that couldn't wait. With that she got up, put her cup in the sink, kissed me goodbye, and was out the door before I could respond. Before getting much further into this story, I should tell you a little about us. I am Tim Johnson. My wife Debbie and I have been married for over 41 years. That's right, we married right out of high school when we were 18 years old. We knew each other since second grade. We dated all through high school and we both knew we were meant to be together for the rest of our lives. Neither of us ever dated anyone else and as such we learned about sex together and as such, we were our only sexual partners. Hell. I never even kissed another woman other than a peck on the cheek in greeting, and I assume it was the same with my wife. We went to the same college as a married couple living in a cheap apartment with part-time jobs to see us through. I had the GI Bill to help with school costs and her parents helped her out so while it was a bit of a struggle it wasn't all that harsh in existence. In fact, we started our family while we were still in college. Our oldest child, Terry is 37 years old, married with two children. She is a family law attorney for an out-of-state firm. Our second Darcy is 35 and single working in Washington, D.C. as an assistant to a director in the Department of Agriculture. Our baby, Sydney, is 34 and married to a police officer in our hometown. She has our other two grandchildren and is a hard-working stay-at-home mom. We are very proud of all three of our girls. After school, I go a job as a risk analyst for a large insurance corporation and Debbie became a grammar school teacher for the local school district and later worked in the administration office part-time. At 59, we are both in excellent health and physical condition. We have both always been very active. I golf, swim, and go to the gym at least three times a week. My wife, however, puts me to shame with her workout discipline. She is at the gym five days a week and is an avid distance runner pretty much every day. I may be biased, but she is still the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. She weighs the same as she did the day we got married. Not bad for three kids in 41 years. When we were young, she was so beautiful that when she entered a room, even the women would stop to stare at her. To this day, she draws attention from men half her age. But she always handles herself with class and dignity. Debbie and I talk about it all the time. Our family life is the epitome of the American dream. We were so lucky to have found each other, and we thank our lucky stars for the life we lead every day. Unlike most men when they hear words to the effect, Honey, we have to talk. I wasn't filled with dread or breaking out into cold sweats. I was curious, but we talk all the time. Family meetings we called them, and we had them even before we had children. It was our way of planning our lives. But she didn't say we were going to have a family meeting, did she? At work I wasn't consumed with angst about the upcoming meeting, but I did daydream a bit of a very memorable love-making session the night before. Debbie is a very vocal and direct lover. She is not at all bashful about telling me what she wants and making sure she gets it. She never fakes an orgasm, because long ago we discussed that we had to be honest with each other and strive to make our love life better. Faking orgasms wouldn't help. Debbie isn't one of those ladies that will have a series of small orgasms. When she goes over the edge, it is with an incredible amount of screaming. Her whole body quivers as her eyes roll up into her head, and sometimes she even passes out for a few seconds. She doesn't even want to be touched for a few minutes because her whole body is so sensitive. It is amazing to watch and be a part of. She tells me all the time that she would never cheat on me because it would take too long to train a new lover. After 41 years of marriage, we still make love two to three times a week. Another thing she tells me often, as she did last night, is that while my meat may not work like it did when I was 25, my lips, tongue, and fingers were magic and working better than ever. All in all, we enjoyed a very satisfying love life well into our middle age. As my curiosity was aroused, I left work a little early and headed home. I wanted to get home before Debbie so I could change and get comfortable with a glass of my favorite single malt scotch and find out what our talk 
was about. My curiosity started to turn to worry when I pulled into the garage and saw that my wife's seven-year-old Camry was already there. My worry deepened when I saw her sitting at the table with a glass of wine in her hand and my scotch already poured and placed at my seat. She looked very distraught as she was continually rubbing her knee with her free hand. This was a nervous habit of hers ever since I knew her. I asked if I could go change before we started. She replied, No, I want to do this right now. Please sit down. I didn't argue as I was sitting down. I was convinced she was going to tell me that she was sick. I felt my chest getting tight and was having difficulty breathing normally. I looked into her eyes and saw, well, I don't know what I saw, but I knew I had never seen that look in her eyes or that facial expression before. She seemed nervous and her voice was breaking as she spoke in a very low, deliberate manner. Tim, there is something I have been thinking about for quite a while and I need to get this out without interruption. Please let me finish before you speak so that I can make you understand how important this is to me. As she continued, she seemed to gain a little more confidence, and I need you to not lose your temper and turn this into a childish yelling match. Can you do that for me, please? I nodded my head slowly without speaking. Well, at least she wasn't going to tell me that she was sick, but I suspected it was going to be much worse. And, I was right. Honey, you know that I love you more than life itself. I have loved only you since the grade school. There has never been anyone else in my lifetime. My chest was hurting more, my breathing becoming more difficult, and an aching pain began in my shoulder as she continued. You and I are going to spend our old age together, bouncing our great-grandchildren on our knees. We are going to travel the world together, but there is something that I have to do. The pain in my shoulder was now shooting down my left arm, and I was getting dizzy. I couldn't catch my breath. Tim, pay attention. This is very important. I just nodded and thought this couldn't be happening to me. Well, I have been thinking for months about this, and there is something I have to do before I am too old. The room started spinning, and it felt like someone was standing on my chest. I am going to date other men to see what I have been missing all these years. It won't last forever, maybe six months, and I will be back to being your loving wife, proving to you every day how deep my love for you is. I started to say something, but nothing would come out of my mouth, then everything went black. Light was creeping in from the darkness trying to break through the haze. I was trying to open my eyes, but my eyelids must have weighed five pounds each. I struggled mightily to get them open and I finally accomplished the task. Where was I? What were those beeping noises? How come I can't move? My throat was very sore. What is my name? I must be in the hospital. What happened to me? All these thoughts were rushing through my head when I remembered that I was Tim Johnson and I was in a hospital because my wife tried to kill me. Why did she try to kill me? My brain was working a little better. I was at the kitchen table. She was talking. Then I remembered the conversation. It wasn't really a conversation, it was her telling me something. Telling me that she was going to kill me. As the fog in my brain cleared, I noticed a nurse standing at my bedside looking down at me and smiling. Welcome back, Mr. Johnson. My name is Nurse Smith. You are in Mercy Hospital because you had a very serious heart attack a few days ago. It is called the Widowmaker, and you were lucky to be alive. Funny. I didn't feel lucky. It's 3 a.m. and the doctor will be by later this morning to explain in more detail about your condition. I tried to talk but nothing came out because my throat was so sore and dry. Don't try to talk, Mr. Johnson. You had a ventilator in your throat so it will take a couple of days to heal itself. I was thinking more clearly now and made a writing motion with my hand. Nurse Smith handed me a pad of paper and a pen. I wrote in big bold print. No visitors. She responded. Oh no. You have had lots of visitors. Your wife and daughters have been here. She must have noticed me wince and stopped talking. I wrote furiously, I don't want any visitors. She seemed startled but asked, are you sure? I just nodded my head. I scribbled another note, do not share my medical information with anyone. Her eyebrows arched up, but she just nodded her head as I was writing another note. Is there someone here at the hospital that can help me complete a DNR, do not resuscitate, order? With that I am sure I shocked Nurse Smith but she held her composure. Your condition isn't nearly that severe. I interrupted her by tapping furiously on the notepad. I will pass your will wishes on to the day shift. She patted me on the shoulder and left my room quietly. I figured my life was over anyway, so if something happened why let the medical community resuscitate me? The way my luck was going I would probably survive but be turned into a vegetable, so screw it. Plus, there would be the added shock benefit when my wife found out what I did and how badly she had hurt me. I didn't fall back asleep. I mean I had been asleep for a few days, so all I could do was lay there and think and make plans. 
I said I did risk analysis for an insurance company, but really my job was to help my company's clients do risk analysis for their organizations. It was a service my company offered and many clients took advantage of it. I had done it for a number of years and was good at it and got paid accordingly. In my experience, all companies are afraid of something but my job was to make sure they were afraid of the right things and offer solutions to mitigate those threats. There is a process involved in accomplishing that analysis, so I decided to adopt the same strategy to solve my problem. You know the problem of why my wife would want to kill me. I know my wife didn't really try to kill me with her statement, but she damn near accomplished it. The actions I had just taken would buy me time, and time is what I needed to figure this out. As I lay there in bed waiting for dawn to break, I began the process of analyzing my situation. I am one of those weird people that when I think, I have a conversation with myself, and this was no different. Okay, Tim, you bought yourself some time, now let's think about the real issues here. It really wasn't all that unusual for my wife to talk very directly and succinctly. So, she wasn't trying to shock me with her statements. It was just how she approached things her whole life. What did she say? She had thought about it for months. Was there anything I should have noticed? Changes in her behavior? Had she been giving me verbal hints that I had missed? Could she have already been cheating on me? The answer is no to all of those. Debbie isn't flighty or prone to acting spur of the moment. While she is deliberate, once she formulates a course of action, she doesn't hesitate or waffle, she goes for after it. Another very important fact is, she didn't say she would like to date other guys, she said she was going to date other guys. So, Tim, this means you have a real problem that probably won't just go away because she put you in the hospital. Damn. So, Tim, here are the outcomes that I can see. 1. You could just let her date guys and hope that sooner or later she gets it out of her system and we can go back to how things were. 2. You can try to talk her out of it because frankly, I don't see myself being the kind of husband that shares his wife. 3. Just divorce her now and be done with it. Or, 4. You could just die now and not have to worry about it. Frankly, number 4 is not looking too bad right now. I still feel like shit. Apparently, I was wrong though. I could fall asleep, because the next thing I knew daylight was streaming in through the window, and the clock on the wall said it was 10.40. Shortly after I awoke, a doctor did come by and explain that a widow-maker heart attack is caused by a complete blockage of the left anterior descending artery of the heart. He said I was very lucky because this type of heart attack has a very low survival rate. If my wife hadn't been with me and called 911 right away, I would have died. Okay, he was the second person to tell me how lucky I was but I still wasn't feeling it. I asked him if severe stress can cause this type of attack. He said, well, yes, severe emotional trauma could trigger it, but your heart problem has to have existed for a while. It is caused by a combination of genetics and high cholesterol. Why do you ask? I explained as best I could what had transpired between my wife and I. He commented, well, that explains your request for no visitors in the DNR. Mr. Johnson, you will be in here for a few more days but you are going to need lots of rest and quiet during your recovery period, which will take some time. We were able to put a stint in instead of doing a bypass, so that should shorten your recovery time. I can't help you with your personal problems, but I strongly recommend that you see a counselor to help you with your issues once you are on the road to recovery. Believe it or not, one of the most frequent side effects of a heart attack like this is depression, and it's obvious to me with your relationship issues you will be a high risk. With that, he left the room. No goodbye. Nothing. I don't blame him. Doctors don't usually like to get personal with patients. Just give them pills or operate on them then get out. Then another doctor who told me she was the hospitalist and went over all the drugs I was going to need for the next year or so. It was a damn pharmacy list. Yep, solution 4 was looking better all the time. Shortly after the hospitalist left I heard a commotion in the hallway. The commotion was my wife being told that she couldn't see me. After causing quite a scene, she asked about my condition. They actually had to call security and have her forcibly removed when she was told that I specifically said she was not to be told my condition. For the first time since she hit me with her plans, I felt a little better. It's childish I know, but still it was a small victory. Apparently, the doctor after having learned of my situation had ordered a sedative for me. Either that or I was so tired I slept on and off for over 24 hours. When I awoke again it was the middle of the night and Nurse Smith was standing at my bedside. I'm glad to see you awake, she said with weighted cheerily for me. Can you try speaking a little for me? I was able to speak although with a little hoarseness, but at least I could talk, thank goodness. She asked if we could talk and I nodded my head yes, but only if she called me Tim. She laughed and said that was fine, 
and to please call her Beth. She started out by saying she had been updated on my situation and understood more about why I had set up the no visitor policy, but was still concerned about the DNR request. I told her to forget the DNR. I didn't really want to die and that I knew that sooner or later I would have to talk with my wife. But I certainly didn't want to do that until I had recovered sufficiently. Beth then told me that she understood, but that she had to kick my wife and all three girls off the ward shortly before I woke up. She told me what I already knew. That, I would have to talk with my wife at some point, but given the circumstance maybe I could talk with my daughters? At this point it struck me how much, if anything, did my daughters know about what their mother had said to me. The girls were very close to their mother, and it could be that they knew in advance what she was going to say? Probably not, but Debbie was especially close to Darcy. Even though she was in Washington, D.C., they talked just about every day on the phone, so maybe Darcy was aware? Maybe Debbie had told the girls the truth after what happened to me? At any rate, I agreed with Beth that I should talk to the girls especially because the older ones had traveled a great distance to be near me. Beth said that she would contact them and have them return to speak with me, but only one at a time. I told her in no uncertain terms though I wasn't going to talk with my wife and she understood. I thought it interesting that the girls were back outside my room within five minutes. Apparently, Beth had only kicked them to the waiting room. I'm pretty sure the fix was in, but I did want to see my girls, so, what the heck? I did talk with each of my daughters that evening, but told them I didn't want to talk about their mother. I wanted them to know how glad I was to see them, and that I loved them very much. I had tears in my eyes, and became quite emotional when I finally realized how close I had come to never seeing them again. Sydney did manage to sneak in that Debbie had told all three of them that she blamed herself for what happened to me, but with no specifics. I didn't argue the point with Sydney, and I know she found that interesting. She also mentioned that Debbie promised to sit down with them tomorrow and explain further. Terry and Darcy did tell me that they would be taking extended time off to help with my recovery. I was overwhelmed with emotion and Beth had to put an end to the visit. After the visits with my daughters, I knew that no matter what happened with Debbie, life would go on. My life was going to be more complicated, but it wasn't going to end. I just needed to decide what to do about my relationship with my wife. Was there even a point in talking to her about it? Even if she scrapped her dating plans, could I still live with her? I needed to answer that question before talking with her. Maybe the girls could help me with the decision. If Sydney was right, Debbie would have filled them in on what precipitated my heart attack, so their perspective might help me. Cheating doesn't just affect the couple's relationship, it affects the whole family. A very interesting development was that my wife and daughters decided that when released from the hospital I would stay at our house while my wife would move in with Sydney's family into their guest room. Terry and Darcy would alternate providing what care I would need for a few weeks. The doctors were confident that I would be back to normal activities within five to six weeks. I was content with the arrangements but thought it very odd that the first two weeks I was home my wife never made a single attempt to contact me. Not even a text message. Perhaps the girls read her the riot act and told her to back off. Or, could she be using the opportunity to go out on dates? I just didn't know, but really, I wasn't up to a direct confrontation. I decided to speak with Darcy first as she had always been closest to her mother and would possibly give me a peek into my wife's state of mind. Darcy and I met alone at the house and she knew ahead of time that I wanted to talk about the incident with her. I, like my wife, I'm a pretty direct person so as soon as Darcy walked into the room, I blurted out, Darcy, how long have you known about your mother's desire to date other men? I, ah, uh, we talked about it some. She mumbled without making eye contact. How long, Darcy? I growled. I'm sorry, Dad. About three to four months. My blood pressure was rising and I was losing control already. This wasn't good. I needed to calm down. I'm sorry, Darcy. I didn't mean to yell at you. I really want your input here. This has hit me really hard. I had no idea your mother wasn't happy with our relationship. It's literally breaking my heart. I tried a little levity to calm myself. Oh, Dad, she loves you very much, and this doesn't mean anything. She just wants to experience some things before she gets too old. It shouldn't reflect on your relationship at all. Do you really believe that bullshit? I mean, really, Darcy, how can her having sex with other men not mean anything to me? I'm flabbergasted that you can say that. So, your opinion is that I should allow her to have sex with other men, so she can experience more in her life, then return to me as if nothing has happened. Well, maybe not as if anything has happened, but your love for her should be strong enough to get past this. She has devoted her entire life to you, to all of us, and she just wants this for herself. Really, Dad, you're 59 years old, and you have probably slowed down some, 
it's normal that mom wants to experience younger men. It's a natural thing for a woman to want to experience. Now there was a shocker. I figured Debbie didn't want to date old men, but hearing that from my daughter really hit home. It was all about sex. While I may have slowed down, I thought I still did pretty good, but I guess I was wrong. Shouldn't her love for me be strong enough that she shouldn't have to date other men to be fulfilled? And what if I have slowed down? That's a reason for her to cheat on me? Don't be silly, Dad. It wouldn't be cheating if you knew about it. That's why she tried to talk to you about it. We went around and around for another five to ten minutes but really didn't get anywhere. Darcy's opinion was very clear on the subject. I had to end this conversation before I exploded. In an almost childlike voice, Darcy asked, What are you going to do, Dad? I don't know, Darcy. I just don't know. But there isn't any way I can live with your mom sleeping with other men. I am just not made that way. I knew full well that Debbie would know the particulars of our conversation in short order. We hugged and said our goodbyes. I thought to myself that I hoped Darcy never married or at least disclosed her beliefs up front to her fiancé. My conversation with Terry was about the exact opposite. She came into the room all charged up and spit out, I can't believe that old hag is doing this to us. Whoa there, I said with my hand up near her face. That's your mother you're talking about, and she isn't doing it to us. She is doing it to me. Get real dad. When someone in the family cheats, it affects us all. So yes, she's cheating on her family. A Terry, you said she is. Not that she is going to cheat. You really are clueless, aren't you, dad? She has been going out with men since you were in the hospital. I think she was doing it before you had your heart attack. I don't think she has slept with any of them yet, but she is definitely auditioning them. I suspected that my relationship with Darcy was pretty much over after that revelation. I wouldn't be surprised if she was setting updates for Debbie. It was odd. I kept waiting for another heart attack or at least a stroke, but it didn't happen. I felt only sadness because at that point I knew my marriage was over. The truth was I wasn't really surprised Debbie did it. She was always headstrong. But why did she call the paramedics when I had the heart attack? It didn't make any sense unless in her own bizarre fashion I guess she did at least like me. All I could do was shake my head. I again wondered if there was really any reason to sit down and talk with her. Terry and I talked for a while longer. Mostly about divorce laws in our state. It really wasn't that complicated in a no-fault state. It was pretty much a 50 to 50 split of all assets. Terry did say I might want to look into a legal separation if I wasn't sure about divorcing Debbie. I told her I would look into it, but didn't think it mattered really. Terry also told me that while my wife couldn't stop a divorce, she could really drag it out. That caught my attention and decided to seek legal advice as soon as possible. Terry said she would send me some recommendations for lawyers the next day. My conversation with Sydney was pretty much me trying to console her as she couldn't stop crying. Her focus was for me to let Debbie come home. I reminded her that I didn't send her away. She could come home anytime she wanted. The house was as much hers as mine. I did ask her a couple of pointed questions. Sydney, has your mother been going out on dates since my hospital stay? While I already knew the answer, I wanted confirmation. Sydney just nodded her head and kept on crying. How often, Sid? Through her tears, she choked out. Just about every night, Dad. I tried talking to her about it. I told her she was cheating on you, and she said she wasn't because she wasn't sleeping with any of them, and besides, she had told you what she was going to do. All I could do was shake my head in disbelief. Before Sydney left, I called her mother and told her that I was feeling better and that she could certainly return to her home anytime she wanted. I emphasized though that I thought she should do it soon because Sydney was going to have a nervous breakdown if she didn't leave her house. I hung up the phone while she was saying something, but I didn't really care what she had to say. I was prepared for our meeting. Sydney had told me my wife would be home at 1 p.m. the next day, so I had spent the rest of the day preparing my notes. When you go into battle, it is essential to have a good plan, thoroughly vetted, and practiced. And I was ready for combat. Of course, the other part of that is that when the first shot is fired, the plan goes out the window, and that is just what happened to me. When Debbie came home for our meeting, she didn't just walk in the front door. She stormed through it and screamed, Where are you? My eyes were already wide as she saw me sitting at the table with my notes spread neatly before me. Without waiting for any comment from me, breathing fire she continued her tirade, there is not going to be any damn divorce. As I previously mentioned, my wife was a school teacher and history was her favorite subject. She was particularly knowledgeable of the American Civil War period. It was obvious to me that she had employed Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain of the U.S. 20th Maine Strategy at Little Round Top on the second day of battle at Gettysburg. 
circumstances had placed Chamberlain's 20th Maine on the extreme left flank of the Union Army and was the only regiment standing between Lee's Confederate Army and Washington, D.C. The fighting was fierce and Chamberlain's men were exhausted and nearly out of ammunition. Their casualties were extremely high and all seemed lost. Then Chamberlain, a rather nondescript college professor of rhetoric in civilian life, did the one thing no one anticipated. He ordered what troops he had remaining to charge. They did, and essentially the Union was saved. Well, that is exactly what my wife did to me. She charged when she should have been on the defensive, and I was completely overwhelmed. The next thing I knew I was on our bed and lying on my back naked and Debbie was riding me with her hands on my chest still screaming something barely intelligible about there being no divorce and we loved each other and would be together forever. My thought was that she was trying to finish the job she started weeks ago when she gave me my heart attack. Much later after having completely wrung me out, she began to get dressed and said she would be back tomorrow with her stuff from Sydney's house and that we would get on with our lives. As she was walking out the door of our bedroom I quietly said, Debbie, thank you for calling the paramedics. She nodded and in an exasperated tone, it's because I love you, dummy, and we are going to spend the rest of our lives together. Now get some rest because we have to make up for lost time. And she headed out the door. Debbie, there's one more thing. I managed to say with as much authority as I could muster. The first time you have sex with someone else, our marriage will be over. In a huff she spat out, that'll be the day. Apparently, she was a John Wayne aficionado too. For a month or two our lives did return to normal, although it was a new normal, because she was still going out. We never said one more word to each other about my threat of divorce. She never really told me that she was going on a date, but once or twice a week she just said she was going out and would be home late. On these nights she would usually get home sometime around midnight. She never smelled of sex although she sometimes looked a bit disheveled. She would shower, get into bed, and then proceed to resume her efforts to kill me with sex. I just went with it and figured if I had to die, this was a great way to go. I knew she hadn't had sex with anyone yet because, well just because I knew. Then one night she got home even later than usual, it was after 1am. I was sitting up in bed reading. I could never sleep when she was out. It wasn't that I was worried about her, I was just waiting for the inevitable. I heard the garage door go up as she pulled her car in. Her heels clicked across the tile floor in the kitchen and the stairs creaked as she walked up. When she came into the bedroom we made eye contact, and I just knew. It was obvious that she knew that I knew. She broke eye contact with me and headed into the master bathroom as she spoke. This doesn't mean anything at all. It is outside of our relation and will be over in a few months. There is no need for further discussion. And she closed the door behind her. When I heard the shower go on, I got up and went into the guest room. Not only did I lock the door, I pushed the dresser in front of it. I wasn't going to make the mistake I made at Little Round Top again. Somehow, I knew though she wouldn't come after me. It wasn't like her. In her mind, when I got over my little snit, things would go on. And, I was right. I never heard a peep out of her the rest of the night. For my part, I didn't sleep at all. There were tears in my eyes mourning the death of my marriage as my thoughts turned to planning. For the next few weeks, we were more like roommates than a married couple. We were polite with each other but simply did our day-to-day -day chores and duties. I know she went out a few more times but I didn't know what she did. I had completely moved into the guest room and in fact was usually asleep when she got home. Yes, I really was asleep. I found that as my plans advanced, I became more relaxed and confident that I had chosen the right path. I never went through a hand-wringing woe is me period, wondering what I could have done better. I didn't chastise myself for not being a more attentive husband. I refused to apologize or accept responsibility for not being aware of every emotion my wife might be experiencing. In my mind, a marriage is a covenant. She broke the contract, not me. She never discussed any issues or disappointments with me. She just told me what she was going to do. The funny thing is, though, that part of me understood why she wanted to experience more. It's a natural human emotion. She just never gave us a chance to figure out alternatives. She had made a unilateral decision that effectively finished us. End of story. I also understood why she made her decision unilaterally. In the Western world, almost 100% of marriages are in some respects female-dominated. Ours was no exception. I suppose if I could find any fault in this mess is that I was too accommodating, but there was nothing in our 50-plus years of being together that should have sent the message to her that I would accept her behavior. I let her make most decisions about our domestic life because it made her happy and it was more important to her. In fact, before we got married, we had long talks about our expectations of fidelity. There was no gray area and certainly no hall passes. 
I was never close to being unfaithful. I never even did anything that would not pass the spouse test, and I expected the same from Debbie. She did this to us, not me. A couple of weeks after Debbie was unfaithful for the first time, I was ready for her. One night when she went out, I sat at our kitchen table where we had most of our family meetings and waited for her to return. When she came home, I said quietly, Debbie, we have to talk. Not now, she said dismissively. I need to take a shower and get some sleep. We can talk in the morning. No. I responded with an authority that she hadn't heard from me before. We are going to talk right now. Sit down, please. She was obviously exasperated with me and sat with a huff into her chair across from mine. Her nervousness was obvious and probably due to the fact her lover's smell was all over her, but I didn't care. I pushed a manila envelope across the table to her and stated clearly, These are divorce papers. I have filed under irreconcilable differences. At this point she started to say something and I put my hand up in front of her face. No. Just sit there. Several months ago, you told me to sit and listen to you without interrupting and I expect you to do the same until I am finished. She leaned back, rolled her eyes, crossed her arms over her chest, and stared at me. I continued. These papers explain everything. My lawyer's card is in the envelope. You can sign and return them to his office. If you don't do this within three days, I will have no choice but to have you served at your workplace. I don't want to embarrass you publicly, but frankly it wouldn't bother me to do that in the place where most of your lovers are. Don't worry. I haven't had you followed. I don't have photos, audio, or video of your infidelities. None of that matters to me. I continued. It's really simple. In a no-fault state, everything is split down the middle. Our children are grown and out on their own. The house is paid for. We pay off our joint credit card debt and we move on. Are you finished? She asked in her most condescending tone. I simply nodded my head. As she stood up, she stated, Good, we are not getting a divorce. I am tired and I'm going to bed. Good night. The next morning, she wanted to talk. Interestingly, she made a nice breakfast for us, the first time in quite a while. She actually appeared to be quite cheerful as she puttered around the kitchen. When breakfast was ready, and I had picked my jaw up off the floor, she calmly sat down and indicated that I do the same with her hand. This was getting surreal. I didn't sit. I told her I would eat out and walked out the door. What she didn't know was that I was headed to the apartment I had rented near work and that I had no intention of ever setting foot in this house again except to remove my things when the divorce was finalized. I thought I heard her softly crying as I got into my car but couldn't be sure. I had no intention of talking any further at this point. My direction was clear. She never initiated contact with me unless it was through her lawyer, and I did the same. She didn't sign the papers, of course, so I had her formally served at work as I had said. She got her own attorney and proceeded to do everything she could to derail the divorce process. No amount of pleading from me or our daughters made any impact on her actions. But in the end, there was nothing she could do to stop the divorce, so six months later we were finally sitting in family court with our respective lawyers. Honestly, I wasn't really paying attention to much of what was being said. I just wanted it to be over. My lawyer had told me that this was the only formal proceeding I had to be present for, and I was grateful. But when the judge addressed my wife directly, I sat up and focused my attention. Mrs. Johnson, why do you not want me to grant this divorce petition as it is written? It all seems a fair disposition of assets. My wife replied as she stood to address the judge dressed like she was going to church, Your Honor. Several months ago, I made a terrible decision that ruined our 41-year marriage. At the time, I was going through menopause and not thinking clearly. I was feeling old and unattractive. Some younger men at work had been flirting with me and showering me with praise and attention. I sadly and ridiculously thought that my husband would understand and let me have a few months of harmless flings. I was dumbfounded as she continued. He knew I was seeing other men for many months, so I assumed he was okay with it. I know now that I was wrong. I stopped seeing anyone when he hit me with divorce papers. In fact, I have been seeing a therapist several times a week and she has helped me see how wrong what I was doing was. I know I can't stop him if he insists on getting divorced, but I was hoping that you could order couples counseling for us to try to put our marriage back together. We have been together for over 50 years and it seems to me that the least my husband could do is agree to go through therapy together before giving up on our marriage. As Debbie was sitting down, she looked over at me with a sly smirk on her face. I thought for sure the judge was going to ask Debbie to marry him he was so enamored with her speech. This wasn't good at all. I looked pleadingly at my attorney for him to do something when I heard the judge addressing me. Mr. Johnson? Mr. Johnson? Are you paying attention? 
I asked you what you thought about what your wife said. She has made some very compelling arguments. Surely your 50-year relationship is worth trying to salvage. Oh shit. I said to myself. This can't be happening to me. My wife could hardly contain her glee. My attorney was doodling something on his notepad. It looked like he was drawing a big Phillips head screw. I am so screwed. But then I had an epiphany. I was in combat again, and the first shot had been fired. I responded, Your Honor, may I have a moment to absorb what my wife has said? She really has given me pause to think this through. I would like to talk with my attorney for a moment. The judge responded quite good-naturedly, of course. I think that is wise. Everyone in the courtroom thought they were witnessing a real hallmark moment. I quickly turned to my attorney who by now had finished his Phillips head screw. What happens if I withdraw my divorce petition right now? Can he still order counseling? My Clarence Darrow-like lawyer turned and stated, No, he can't. The court no longer has any jurisdiction in the matter. One more question, Clarence. Who? That's not important right now. What happens if I just disappear? My wife would have to serve me in order to get a divorce, right? Yes, but it isn't really that simple. She could have a divorce granted for abandonment after one year. He replied, Only if my luck changes. I said wistfully and with a heavy sigh. There isn't a law that says I have to live with my wife, is there? My mind was really racing now. No, there isn't, he said in a lawyerly fashion. Then the light bulb went on in his head and he asked, Will I still get paid? Of course, Clarence, of course. I smiled broadly and straightened my tie, brushed my hands to smooth my slacks and stood up to address the court. Everyone wanted the Hallmark movie ending, so I was going to give it to them, sort of. Your Honor, in light of what my wife has expressed in a most convincing manner, I hereby withdraw my petition for dissolution of marriage immediately. It was bedlam in the courtroom. Not really, there were only about 12 people in there, and it was lunchtime, so those not involved got up to head to the cafeteria. The judge banged his gavel granting my request with a big smile and tears in his eyes. My wife and her attorney were both crying happy tears themselves. I was steaming mad but had plastered what I hoped was a happy face on and walked directly out of the courtroom. I reached my car with my wife hot on my heels blabbering something about us being happy, blah, blah, blah. I started the car and left her standing in the parking lot wondering what just happened. As I pulled out of the parking lot, I threw my phone into the bushes and drove straight to work where I immediately went to HR and retired. I realized that I could draw on my 401k because I was 59 and a half years old. I couldn't get social security for a few more years. But with my 401 with our other assets, I knew I could make this work. From work, I went to our bank. I did all those things people do when they get divorced right away. Our house was paid for and worth almost a million dollars. Everything else we had was about equal to that value, so I was going to take it all and put it into my name only and quit claim the house to Debbie. My family didn't know where I lived and had only been reaching me through work or my phone, so I had time to finish what I was going to do unimpeded. Two weeks later, after having set up this meeting with Debbie, I pulled up to our house, technically my wife's house now I guess, in my brand new 38 Georgetown Class A motorhome. My new Jeep Wrangler 4x4 was hooked to the tow bar behind it and ready to go. I knocked on the door and I heard Debbie approaching the door from inside. All three of our daughters were there too because I had given them a heads up to be there. I knew there would be trouble and needed them to watch out for Debbie. Honey, you're home. Thank God. We were so worried about you. The girls were already staring at the motorhome and were sharp enough to suspect what was up. Sweetheart, I actually stopped by to say goodbye. What do you mean goodbye? We are going to be together forever, aren't we? We've always been together, dear. It's just that I am going away for a while. But Tim, what about work? I retired Deb and I am going to spend some time traveling the country. But honey, I can't get away from the school district on such short notice. School is in session. I know traveling the country in a motorhome is our dream, but I am simply not able to do that right now. She still didn't get it. My daughters got it though, and they were stunned. They were already burning holes in me with their eyes because they knew I was going to leave them to deal with my basket case of a wife and they were not happy. We should go inside and talk Debbie. There is a lot I want to say to you. And I will give you a chance to talk also. We all filed into the kitchen and sat around the table. It made me choke up thinking about all the family meetings we had held at this table. The thought that this would be the last one was almost too much for me to bear. But I had spent the last couple of weeks thinking about my circumstance quite a bit. I had no anger left in me. I was no longer nervous, fearful, or racked with uncertainty. I was more at peace than I had been in years. So, I began the meeting. First off, I want to apologize to you, Debbie, 
and to you girls also, for the way I behaved when you first informed me of your plans to sleep with other men. I know I acted childishly at the hospital. I put my hand up before Debbie could get a word out. Please, let me finish. I know you didn't give me my heart attack. In a perverse sort of circumstance, you might actually have saved my life. The heart attack was going to happen sometime anyway, and because you were right there and called for help immediately, I am alive and here today. The medical people have assured me of that. So thank you. That really threw her for a loop. I've done a lot of thinking since our court hearing and I realized something Debbie. Neither you nor I have ever been on our own. We have been together since elementary school. I think I understand now what your feelings were when you told me what you were going to do. I was focused on the sexual part of your desire when I think you were really saying that you wanted to be alone. You wanted to stand up and take control of your life. Then I realized that I was in the same position as you. Our whole lives, all our plans were done together, and now I want to experience life alone too. I believe that we both need to be apart so we can find out who we are as individuals. At this point, I let her speak because there would have been no stopping her anyhow. But I don't want to be alone. I am never going to give you a divorce. We will be together for the rest of our lives. I messed up so bad when I said those things to you. How she managed to say those things through her tears and sniffles, I don't know. She looked like she was going to start hyperventilating. The girls, though teary-eyed, had stayed remarkably calm and quiet throughout. Deb, I accept that you will never give me a divorce. And I no longer want a divorce. It is irrelevant to me. But we are not going to live together any longer. I need to find out who I am outside of us. I slid the quick claim deed across the table to her. I am giving you the house and have taken most of our other assets and it pretty much comes out a 50 to 50 split. The girls were openly crying now because they understood. Tim, sweetheart, don't do this. I can make it up to you. I know you can forgive me given time. I haven't been with anyone in months. My therapist made me realize how foolish I have been. Please don't do this. You said you were coming back. I already have forgiven you, Deb. I might be back someday. I release you from our wedding vows. I want you to experience everything in life you desire without any guilt. I just can't be here while you do. But how will I reach you if I need to talk with you? You can't abandon me like this. It isn't fair. She had her head in her arms on the table sobbing hysterically, unable to speak further. I turned to my daughters. Ladies, I am sorry it has to be this way. I will love you always and please take care of your mother for me. If you need to reach me, you can email me. I don't have a phone or a mailing address as I don't plan on being in any one place very long. They were all hysterical now as I got up and walked out the door. I got into my motorhome and drove away without looking back and headed off for my new life. Alone. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.